document that I at once created. Oh, if I, I refreshed it, I have access now. Okay. I'm resharing the link to the minutes, so anybody I that... I have access, so I'm good. Thank you. Anyone with access can edit away, including anonymous kangaroo. Are there other topics besides giving access to the minutes that are appealing to people? I have here with me Gabe and Carter, um, who are our principal Augur developers. So to get start, so I guess I don't really need to make an agenda item out of sharing the minutes. No, I'll do my best to take notes here. You can just do your thing. Thank you. So oh, wait, I'll let I'll let Matt do that then, instead of me trying to type over. So the people that we have here, I think what we'd like to do is just give a brief overview of what the technology behind Augur is and uh, installation and the API. So first off, for a brief, and also like take your, like we also wanna have your questions. So any questions that you have specifically about Augur that you would like to see addressed in the, in the larger scheme of things, please, please let us know, speak up, add your things to the notes. So most of you know that chaos slash auger is where that our project lives. What you may not know is that right now the most active branch is the dev branch. We'll be doing the record this on Okay. I'm recording it on Camtasia too because I wasn't quite sure. Um, I'm re I'll just record it, then it'll show up to me and I can post it. Okay. Uh, awesome. So the the repository in the dev branch contains the first you know, the current version of Augur. We'll be doing a uh, pull request out to the main branch here shortly because we've done a, per a number of pretty substantial improvements to workability, usability, and, and those kinds of things. So Augur is, first off, in a single data model, which you can find under persistence schema. Uh, it's a very large SQL file, and there's usually a PDF, which I recently uh, took out of that file because I'm updating it. <coughs> and um, so there's that. And uh, the install process now is pretty simple. So I'm just going to use these, the, the direct directory structure here. Are you, can you share your screen, Sean? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I honestly, in my mind, I was sharing my screen. Yes, here is here is my screen, and this is what I intended to share. So, so Augur Dev Branch, and the basic key to Augur, the things to understand are there's three main directories in the architecture. There are other things like documents and notebooks and tests. Can you Sean, go ahead and record because my record is not working. I am recording, so. Thank you. Sure. Um, the main directories you need to think about are Augur, front end, and workers. And in the Augur directory are a few key things. One is we have what's called a broker. It's a broker. It's a broker architecture. It's a broker architecture. So essentially, everything that Augur collects data-wise, and we collect from a lot of different things, um, comes from a worker through a broker. So there's a broker in this directory that runs, and I'll show you how to start all of that. And then a housekeeper that keeps track of all the jobs that need to be done to collect things. And then there's workers. And so we have a worker called the facade worker that mines all GitHub repositories. We have a GitHub worker that has two jobs. One is it gets issues off of GitHub, and the other is it captures and matches individual identities across GitHub and the repositories that you have. So if you have an email match in your repository for an email that's in the GitHub of the API and available, you can sort of connect those users together. Uh, the insight worker is what's powering our dashboard right now. So it'll identify the most statistically significant changes in your repository groups over a period of uh, time and I believe the default is we're looking at averages over a period of a year 
and then we're showing you the most significant outliers in a 90 day period yes. in a 90 day period right now though in the future that'll be configurable and if you want to see what that looks like I will take you to the auger dashboard where we have a few example repositories where for example you can see the repository rails weblog.git had a sharp decrease in code changes code change lines in the last 60 days and then Comcast eel had a sharp decrease in new issues in the last 51 days. And you have a number of repos identified as the most frequent. The Linux badge worker pulls information from the CI badging program. Pull request worker pulls pull requests. And repo info worker pulls metadata off of GitHub for things like watchers so that you can keep an archive of watchers, forks, followers, all of those kinds of things. And, and all of that is stored inside the Augur, data, the relational database schema within Augur. Let me stop talking for a minute and ask if there are any questions. Is this too technical? Do you want to see something less technical? No, this is good, at least to me. OK. I'll OK. So inside the. Augur directory. On the workers, are there a uh, roadmap for other workers? Yes. On the roadmap, we have next up, I think the ones that we've discussed are workers for the issue trackers uh, uh, at um, Bugzilla, GitLab, and um, Bit Bitbucket, and um, also Garrett. So there's four issue trackers that are not in GitHub that we think are commonly your we've observed or heard from people are commonly used in open source, that those are our next major targets. We also have our, uh, what I call the, I guess it's kind of a value worker that's gonna do all the Kokomo calculations. Right now I can run that behind the scenes for people, but we're, we're automating that right now. And actually one of our Google Summer of Code students has that as a project that they're doing right now. So that's, those are other workers that are currently in the works. And so every single worker talks to this broker, um, which gets started when you start Augur. And so inside of Augur, the, inside this Augur directory, the most important things to know about, I think, are probably data sources. So Augur DB is our main data source now. And most of Augur DB uh, the API endpoints are inside of this Augur DB giant file that we will be refactoring into smaller files um, in the near future. So if I want to install Augur, I clone the repository. Those, those are the API endpoints that the workers use? Or? Those are the API endpoints that the front end uses. They're the metrics. The metrics. They're metrics endpoints. I so okay. yeah, if I go to API docs, oops, that'd be the wrong one. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to remember which one I have up right now. Um, That's okay. That answered my question. No. All right. I have API docs up somewhere right now, but apparently not. Ah, oh, there we go. Yeah. They're actually here. I forgot that I mapped it up. So generally, when you install Augur, um, they will be after an API docs slash. Um, Configuring Nginx is a little bit different than configuring your local machine, and it's a question of really the scale of work that you want to do. So I will share this persistent link um, in the chat for the Zoom call, and then Matt, you can, if you want, copy that over. So if I wanted to install Augur, is my giant purple screen, is this too much to make it bigger. Yeah. I'm a Prince fan. Okay, so I've already done the steps of installing Python and creating a virtual environment. And to create to build Augur these days, it's actually much, much simpler than it was even the last time. Go ahead. Is there a question? Actually, what is a virtual environment? I'm not familiar with that. Sure. 
I will deactivate my virtual environment and show you. So if you download uh, Python, like any Python 3.x, usually 3.6 or 3.7 are common these days, environment, you can use pip or pip3 to install, and this is in our readme file, I believe, to install something called virtual env. And what virtual env allows you to do is it allows you to create an isolated environment for the Python work that you're going to do on a particular instance of Augur or other Python project so that when I download the latest versions or the versions that Augur wants of the certain Python libraries, you're not polluting other projects in a sense that exist on your computer. Right, so if I need, if I need uh, you know, a URL, lib, a URL parser version two for Augur and I need version three for a different project, I can install the specific versions in the specific environments and have both on my computer at the same time as opposed to having to try to manage Manually using two for one and three for the other. So it's like it's like ASDF specifically for Python. I have no idea what ASDF is, Andy. Check, check out check out ASDF. Okay. Sometime. ASDF. Okay. ASDF. All right. So if I wanted to create a virtual environment, I would install Python. I would uh, do a pip install of a program called Virtual Env, and then I'm going to create a virtual env where I'm going to declare python equal to python3 because augur is a python3 application. I usually do this in my home directory so that I can find my or a virtual environments directory so that I can find it again. So python3 I'll give it a, a name new augur and then when I create that it does a few very simple things and when you're done and this again is all in our readme you simply do source, which is not an intuitive term, you know, something that I would periodically forget many years ago. The name of the virtual environment that you created, which was new auger, bin activate, and then in my shell it tells me the name of the Python virtual environment that I'm in, which becomes important then when I go to the auger directory. So this is where I have Augur cloned. Now I have an isolated virtual environment. It's a new one. So what we're going to see now are all of the things, all the Python libraries that I, Augur will download the first time you create a new virtual environment and do this adorably simple command, make install. Mm -hmm. Which will, while this is running, uh, that install command will also do a couple things for you. If you've forgotten to activate your virtual environment or you haven't created one, it will automatically prompt you to create one if you have it or remind you to activate it if you have. Um, it will check to make sure you're running the correct versions of Python and pip as well. Um, we currently support Python 3.6 and above. Um, that's I haven't tested it with earlier versions of 3, so I'm not 100% certain. Um, but I am 100% certain that 3.6 and above is uh, adequate. And then, so this install script will install all of the backend dependencies, um, all the front end, or uh, all of the worker dependencies. It will also set up the API configuration. And then at this point, um, it will ask you whether or not you want to install the front end dependencies. And that's for, if you want to use our pre-built stuff, um, you can just hit one, you can hit yes, and it'll install them for you. If you're more interested in the data and you don't care so much about how we visualized it and want to do your own visualizations, you can skip that step. Um, and then after it's done installing the front end dependencies, what it'll ask you to do is whether or not you want to install, uh, configure your database, or sorry, enter your database credentials uh, at the command line or at the web page. Um, if you're not familiar with the command line or if you would rather just do it on a web page, um, it'll give you that option and it will automatically spin up a web page for you where you can enter all your data, um, hit submit, and then uh, at this point you will have to return to the terminal to do some stuff, um, but we'll see that once that gets there. Hopefully and yes, be. you're seeing a bunch of errors and these non-critical node package manager errors. errors are an irritation to us. They're, yes. they're unpretty. And we could write them out to a file so that you didn't see them, but we're showing you our ugly underbellies. We want to be honest. Um, this, this isn't, uh, none of this breaks Augur. There are just some circular dependencies and failures of node libraries to update things. But I've, I've seen them since the day I started last 
not last February, but February before, and they haven't gone away, and it still works. So, so this is the section I was talking about. You can either enter your credentials at the command line or on a web page. Um, so for command line is pretty simple. So for the sake of the demo, let's do a web page. So you just get to hit two and then enter, and it will automatically pop up um, a web page for you that's just running locally on your own machine. Um, nobody else can get to this, and this is just for simplicity. Um, if people are unfamiliar or uncomfortable with the command line, um, this is a good way to do it. So we'll go ahead and enter our credentials, which is what Sean's doing. Oh, it's showing my password today. Oh, I guess it is. It didn't earlier. It didn't for me earlier. It didn't for me earlier. It works on my machine. <laughs> right? It were, oh. Oh, you get last pass. Yeah. All right, and then you would put in your GitHub API key. Yep. And then you hit submit. Yes, and, and this is something that we do that is going to be fixed. Um, so you, once you hit submit, you will need to come back uh, to the shell. And yes, and then hit enter, and it will continue. So and at this point, um, now that we've got the credentials, we're gonna. Um, I'm gonna say no because I gave I didn't want to type in actual usernames and passwords on a taped demo. So I'm not going to overwrite my mm -hmm. auger configuration. So if you had selected yes, um, it would have automatically uh, created the auger.config.json for you in the correct place, uh, would have inserted those credential values that you had asked for, and then provided um, what we think are the sensible defaults for all the other parameters. And for the most part, you shouldn't have to mess with any of those defaults. There might be some stuff that might need a little bit of tweaking. Um, but at this, at this point, once you get to this step, you should have a um, a mostly working version of Augur, provided that you do have the database set up outside of it. Right, and I think the next thing that we're working on with the install is to let people insert their own databases, or insert their own repos to collect things from. Yeah, so the next, uh, as far as the install goes, I know this is something that you and I talked a lot about, Matt, at, um, at the Open Source Summit. Um, so one of the other things that we're going to do with the installation process is allow people to install, uh, specify the repos they want to collect data for at this point, um, as opposed to having them do that right now. We have to do it manually, um, just because that would be easier for people to do that on a web page. Um, and plus, there just needs to be some tooling around doing it automatically, um, as well as um, doing some more error checking, getting rid of that weird thing where you have to go back to the terminal. Um, to stop the server to get it to keep going. Um, there are a couple other usability things that I really think will make this a lot better. Um, but it's definitely come a long way since since our demo. Yeah. I, I would hope. Yeah. I would hope you would agree, Matt. <laughs> I do. And so, so this is under the the. Um, right now, it's under the dev branch of Augur. Mm -hmm. We'll be do, we'll be doing a pull request shortly after we fix a couple of little things that are annoying us. Mm -hmm. But this is under the assumption that there's a database already installed. Yes, and so that is a um, thing for mining action. That that's another uh, section of the install that I want to help automate. Um, uh, if you choose the command line option, it does ask you if you have a database. Um, it asks you a couple things: whether or not you have a local installation, whether or not somebody else has an installation that you can use, um, and whether or not the schema is already installed. So yep. that's a section that I haven't gotten to yet, but it will be like, okay, so you. You have a local installation, you don't have the schema. Okay, give us the credentials to your local installation and we will install the schema for you. Okay. Um, so that, that so that, was that what that web, re web request was too, to essentially get that schema? Yes. Data? Okay. Yeah. Um, so that that part I haven't gotten to yet, um, just because okay. I, this was like a minimum viable product for yeah. me. Just, it's a script, gets you all the parts you need. Um, but I want, ideally, um, my goal is to get to the point where uh, the user, the only thing the user has to um, put in when they do an installation is their credentials, and everything else will be taken care of. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like the database will get set up, the schema, the API docs, dependencies, all that stuff will be taken care of. Yeah, we do, we do have some old things in our repo for loading repositories, uh, so there's a way to do it, um, but it's not. It's not as pretty as maybe you would want it to be right now. And so now I'm going to go back to my terminal. And if I want to start Augur, you'll see a couple of executables. I have instructions for, uh, we've been running Augur. We can run it behind Nginx if you want a server. You can also run it locally. And so I think on my computer, we're going to do an Augur local start. Fingers crossed this works. 
Oh, uh, uh, oh, you make dirt logs. Yep, do it again. So, maybe just uh, have that be part of the install? Yeah, uh, yeah well, that's, that's that should be part of the starting script. But yeah, that's a... Okay. Okay, so now it's gone and it's uh, created an auger process that runs in the background on the front end and the back end. And I am just going to go back to the readme. Because the readme explains that where that is running is localhost 8080. It should be on your computer. If you have something running already on port 8080, it will not be on port 8080. But since we had nothing else running, it, will, it, it showed up here. Okay, so this also, as part of the install, did it also include the, the Nginx server? Or did that happen? Right now, we're, we're actually not serving it on an Nginx server, so the local developer version uses what? Um, it, just, it just runs two processes in the background. So the, the, what's the web server, though? Um, what's serving up the view pages? Oh, I like Flask or NPM? I'm not sure I answered your question. What's serving up this page right here that we're yeah. looking at? This local host page. Which I haven't tried on my machine before. Uh, I think it's a node server. It's not a. It's not Nginx. <laughs> if I understand. Like a badge or to to run to get to that page, the command we run is npm run serve. So I guess the com I guess the answer is npm. Or okay. not not npm. Sorry. Yeah. No. So it it went to Finland for the data in this particular configuration and came back. So it works a little faster on the uh, not Finland if I'm actually running all the databases and stuff on the same machine. Um, you can see these are the highlights here and you can see a repo list. This particular instance has something like 2,400 repos in it. So the repo page can take a little bit to load at a distance. Um, you can sort by any of the columns. So if I go to, z yeah. How did you get this data? This is the Zephyr stuff. It looks like. Yep. So what point in this install process did you point to the Zephyr repo? In this install process, I didn't. I made that kind of magic that you didn't see. Okay. Um, and I can I can unmagic that for you. Um, that is part of what we need to, one of the things we need to improve is the CSS and the way that it spreads on different pages. Oh, I, I know, I made my browser so big for other, everything else. So from what I'm understanding so far, at least from an in install perspective, I would, I as a user would install MySQL. I would run the- Postgres actually. Postgres, I would install Postgres. I would run through the install documents that you provide on the, GitHub repository, right, which will actually install the schema and all of the harder parts. Yes, my local machine. Yep. Um, and then at some point in there, and I have to answer a few questions along the way, basically giving data. Right. For the GitHub worker. So all of the um, all the workers that we have are going to talk to the broker, but they're okay. for the ones that are GitHub or really I think GitLab has APIs. Anything that requires an API call will require an API key. So um, that web page that you showed that was asking for the database credentials and like GitHub credentials, that's actually asking for data for two different things. Is that correct? One is to connect to the database, and the other is to allow the workers to do their work. Yeah, yeah. that's a good way to put it. Yep. Okay, maybe on that web page you could describe that a little bit. I think that's a good suggestion. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I built that I built that page in maybe 15 minutes, because sure. I didn't know how to right, do it. Right, it's <laughs> just like two sentences. Like, yeah. Fill in this yeah. information to connect to the database. Fill in this information so that the workers can do their work. Right. Um, and then... It's, and then I finish. Are there, what other questions am I ask, answering? So well, I can take you back. I can take you back through it one more time. You want to go through it again? No, I'm just trying to remember. 
so the, the, the questions it asks you are, do you want to install front-end dependencies? Um, do you want to, and then there's the, do you want to install on a web page or on a command line? Okay. And then if you, do, if you do the command line, it'll ask you some more questions about like your um, current database configuration, like what the options are. I would, I would put a pin in going through that part just because it's, I haven't gotten to that yet. Um, so there's stuff that I need to do that I haven't, so I don't know if it would okay. be ultimately productive for us to worry about that part right now. Um, I mean, already this seems infinitely easier than what was going on in San Diego. Yeah, that was that was the goal. Um, so then, so then you go ahead and you start it locally. You finish the install process. You start it local, which didn't look over the top hard. You start it locally, and then I would be able to. Even though I haven't pointed it at a repository, I'd be able to see this Augur page, correct? But it would just be obviously empty. Yes. Because the workers have no idea where to go. Yeah. And, and we do have plans to give you give developers sample data if mm -hmm. they want to just just have a. We're trying to decide how big that should be, uh, and we'll definitely take suggestions from everyone on this call about like how big a sample database. I was thinking something like 30 repositories with all the data collected. You, like, you just shipped it with like like current Rust yeah. Rust project info, Don. I don't know yeah. if you're all right with that, but something along those lines. Yeah. Learn. Yeah, so, so yeah, something like that. Um, and then, and I mean, that can even just be marked. So then I guess the question that I missed but the, the spot that I missed was how I go about, in this case, like getting the Zephyr repo. So in this case, we populated it for you, but I, I guess what I, I brought up the data model here just to give you an idea of the straightforwardness of what needs to be populated. So I, I don't think there's, there's two ways that we actually populate the data, and there are there is an app actually in the docs setup folder in our dev repository and master repository that lets you go out and, for example, choose a GitHub organization and get all of the Git URL links for that GitHub organization and walks you through a fairly eh, not pretty process of creating them. But essentially what you do is you decide these are the repositories that you want to watch. And the most important piece of information is the URL. Everything else kind of can come from, you know, the repo ID is automated, uh, the repo group ID, which you create down here. So every repository has to exist in a repository group. Yep. And in the case of many of the people who use Augur, there is one repository group. We have one organization with as many as almost 300 uh, repository groups. Depends just how you want them organically organized. And then essentially there's just a very straightforward process of populating them and then starting the workers to collect data. Mm -hmm. So once once you have your list of repositories, the you can just have the workers begin automatically when you start Augur. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, part of the install process in the future will include the section for asking what URLs you want, um, and it will take care of the inserting and the, we'll do as much as we can to put this to remove this process from the user, so we'll make it as, as as straightforward as possible. We don't want them to have to come in here and edit the database directly, because so that's intimidating if you've never done it before. If, so if you're a community manager with 30 Git URLs that you want to use, we're just going to ask you for those 30 Git URLs, and if you want to put them in more than one repository group, and I think that's kind of all that we really need to ask them for. Mm -hmm. you know? we do at, wait, so when you say a repository group, so like in the case of a community manager that has, I'll just stick with your 30 repositories, um, I would feed those via text file. Would that be possible? Yeah, I think, I think that'd probably be the first and easiest thing to do is just give us a, a return separated list of Git repository URLs mm -hmm. and then we could walk you through if you want them grouped together or grouped separately yeah and then um, 
you said you would group them. How do you? Uh, what's the so, rationale of grouping them? So it depends on it depends on the scale of organization that you're running. For example, we have a couple organizations with a hundred or fewer, around a hundred or a little more than a hundred repositories that just put them in one organization. So if I'm a community manager and I really have one open source ecosystem that I'm paying attention to, and all I have are all these repositories are in my world, and I want to see the summary of my world then the repo group summary is going to be just all my repositories. Mm -hmm. But if I'm... You want to put in that group. Yeah, but if I'm a, a community manager that maybe has like five worlds that I'm kind of keeping my eye on, I might want to put those sets of repositories in a different world. And that will give you different summary level statistics about about the that world. That world. So is it the person, the human, that defines what goes in a group? Yes. Yes. And the, is yeah. there a concern that the way that Brian might create groups is different than the way that Don might create groups is different than the way that I might create groups? Is well, there, a, well, um, I mean, I think we want people to create the groups they want to create. We're not, I, I think that's part of it is you can, com you can compare the things that you want to compare. Mm -hmm. We don't have a spe the set definition of like all of the repositories have to be related to each other. All you know, they don't have to come from the same organization. It's whatever you want to compare as a group. It's I want to look at the trends across this group of repositories, whatever those repositories are. Okay. If that answers your question. It does. And I, I don't know that it's bad or I didn't mean to imply that it was bad. Yeah, There's yeah, no. There are any downstream consequences of allowing people to make judgments. Yeah. Well, I think we're like any software people were always embarrassed about the current state of our product in some way and mm -hmm. we're just not giving you the full conference room demo where everything looks beautiful and works perfectly we're kind it of works we're better gonna, it works well uh, <laughs> i guess better. then in, in that in that stage there's going to be kind of two steps one is the identification of all the git repos right however many that might be and then a second step of actually grouping those git repos if you choose to and if you if yeah, and if you change if you change the groups, I'm trying to think this through. Um, actually, if you change, I think it'll be it'll be possible to change the groupings, and it's also possible to do comparisons across groups. So um, this might be a good moment. Well, let, let, this is a moment to pause and ask if anyone has any burning questions that they want to ask. I've been asking a ton, so I have questions. Yeah, go for it. Uh, first of all, I have feedback. Um, I think what you guys have done is awesome. And so you shouldn't be embarrassed at all. Um, uh, Self-conscious, perhaps. We're yeah. adolescent, in a sense. <laughs> yeah, it's going through puberty right now. I think it really looks great. Uh, so my first question. Um, in terms of the overall architecture, do I understand it right that the, the Python code simply serves up a, a RESTful UI, and then the HTML pages are rendered like by a standalone JavaScript application. How's, how's that all working? Gabe, do you want to speak to the, in general, yes, you're right. There's a, there's a backend API that is all written in Python, and if I go to, um, uh, uh, you have to go to Portrait. Oh, okay. So the default port for the, the data be, to be served on is port 5000 and it's API unstable. So. So they're essentially like, uh, well they have like completely different dependencies and are run differently, but how they're connected is that our front end hits the endpoints that our back end serves. And so that's how it's able to get all of its data. But Just for data. Yeah, they're essentially separate in terms of dependencies and how you run them. Mm -hmm. so, so you can cool. run the back end. So at least Twitter, if you saw it, the Chaos Cons running our back end, but they've built their own front end to display the data that they want to show. Yeah, we wanted and our back end endpoints to kind of be modular, you know, because some people want that freedom to have their own visualizations. So sure. we, we place the highest, we, we make sure that we serve the data and I think the API is reasonably coherent. 
one thing that you'll notice is you'll have for most API endpoints an endpoint for the repo group and an endpoint for the repo that's individual. The idea is that you could you, you may want to see summary statistics for a collection of repositories or for an individual repository and most of the data most of the endpoints that we provide have both. Yeah. Uh, the ones that don't there are logical sort of self-apparent reasons for that. Another thing to notice is that the chaos metric definition is also linked where there is a chaos metric definition for the item. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, so, okay, so essentially there's there's a backend process that lists, lists inside of port 5000, and then there's there's the front end that we see here. Um, is, is there anything, any concept of authentication or or user accounts for the back end or the front end, um, or is it just is it just an open access type of a system? Right now, there isn't an implemented user login. You can see that we thought about it. Okay. We have a plan. We have yeah. a plan. Uh, it's certainly on our roadmap to provide authentication. I think, depending on how things go, you know, we want to maybe use something that is a standard SSO tool. And and some of the, and we mostly haven't built it because, as far as I, a lot of these features aren't necessarily account specific. Like people will have their own installations of Augur. Um, or their own set of repositories we care about, they care about, but for right now, it's just more efficient for us to set those up for them and help them with that as opposed to having one central account, if that makes sense. In the future, there will be more web-based configuration options, uh, including setting repository groups and more configuration stuff, and at that point, those will be locked behind an authentication. Like, you can't go and change these settings unless you're actually the person who made these settings, if that makes sense. Like. Yeah. There's stuff in the future that's coming that needs authentication, but nothing right now that needs it, so we haven't built it. I think, yeah. First first on our roadmap, I think, is the, the, the individual community manager use case, so that they can actually just download Augur and install it on their computer and keep track of the 10 repositories they care about. Um, that's, that's, I think, the first use case that we're targeting. I, I do think that login's really important, and I'm interested in what folks on the call think about login or not or if we were to tie into an SSO which are the ones that you would want us to think about being tied into if you so my, my opinion is leave login out let that you know um, I wouldn't worry about it for now that's, yeah. that's, my, that's my opinion yeah, I'm in the same same boat okay in fact it really quite simplifies things to not have a login just make it open access and and require separate instances for, for different organizations. I think that's great, personally. Um, let's see, so my, my second question is, um, let's say that I've got um, a new worker that pulls in issues from a different type of repo that you haven't done. Um, and that worker operates as a standalone like program. Not a git, like not a git repo? Not get a repo, you know. Let's okay. let's just and this is this by the way is hypothetical, just just for purposes of understanding. Sure. How you set this up? So let's say I've got a new worker. It's a let's let's say it's a bash script. It pulls in it pulls in issues from a different type of a repo that you haven't done. Should that worker interact directly with your database, or should it should it do all of its interaction through your REST API? Or do you not have an opinion? Yeah. So, so from from a worker perspective, if you've got if you want to build build a worker, I think that I would I would take you back to our repository, and I would take you to the workers directory, and I think I'd take you to the GitHub worker, as a good example of a worker that's focused on collecting data, okay. and has the logic necessary to collect data from GitHub issues in a reliably w in a reliable way uh, yeah. including okay. including things like keeping track of your rate limit so that if you if your rate limit if you exceed your rate limit it just waits until you're you've got more time you know another 5,000 requests um, 
And so I would start by just looking at the GitHub worker and in, inside the GitHub worker, if you look in this folder, there are two, there are two files um, for every worker. Well, there's three, I guess. One is the init.py, which is, you can see very minor. And for some reason, my team has decided to attribute it always to me. And then you have runtime.py. This is going to be fairly standard across the workers. Um, it doesn't change a lot. Maybe Gabe. Could it's just uh, hosting a Python Flask app so that it can serve a, just a couple minimal routes so that the broker is able to. Come closer, Gabe. It's okay. So that the. Uh, <laughs> take this seat. Here, here, you can take this seat and I'll sit in the rocking chair. Oh boy. Right. So this file just. Uh, we'll stand behind you hosts the Flask app for the worker and the reason why it needs a Flask app is because our inner process communication is through HTTP so in order for the worker to receive tasks it needs its own routes for the broker to send it tasks in um, and yeah this file is just basically the initialization of the worker so yeah, if you so if you think about it, when you're trying to, if you want to create a new worker, if that's the kind of thing that you're into, first of all, we love you, and um, the runtime pi is going to be very standard. The worker dot pi is really where uh, each worker is significantly differentiated from the other because the logic involved in collecting data from the GitHub API for issues is different than the logic for collecting information about people or pull requests. Although it's it's surprisingly similar for pull requests, but still different. Now maybe you can talk about that, Gabe. Yeah. So this file is basically just the guts of the entire worker. It connects to our database. Um, it will do any kind of collection of data. So with this worker, it's like hitting the GitHub API, um, and it also does all the storage of all the data and organizing, just getting it ready to store in the database. And it's um, in the. I mean, and our workers have all, I think, been. We've been using a couple of very large repository collections. To I would say, most of the last four months, um, almost daily, I've been looking at different things that are happening with the workers and validating the data that they're collecting. And they've evolved to the point where they're they're getting pretty hardened mm -hmm. by all of the weird, you know, against all of the weird things that happen and. You know, in the case of the, the facade worker, that's thanks to Brian Warner's work on the facade project. In the case of the GitHub worker, that's uh, Gabe. Um, and uh, the pull request worker, Parth, one of our Google Summer Code students, sort of um, riffed off of Gabe's GitHub worker. Um, yeah, and so as these workers get older and we just uh, have them collecting data, they they do just get a lot more hardened with maturity because they run into these rare cases every now and then uh, that we can then address until the point where we've addressed all the cases. And so in the case of like this worker in Facade, they're like very reliable at this point. And, and Gabe, when you, in this, in this worker, when you store data in the database, are you doing like SQL calls from the worker or are you going through the REST API? How's, how's that go? Uh, so we use a package called SQL Alchemy uh, to do all the data insertions and if we need to query the database for any sort of setting or repo ID or something, we, get, we use the SQL Alchemy package. but. For the facade worker, I know we use uh, like the Psycop 2G package mm -hmm. or something, yeah. uh, and it that one uses direct SQL statements. But SQL Alchemy just has like little easier commands and functions. For what it's worth, the reason that we use two different packages for that, I don't know if I'm on screen, is because we adapted facade from Brian, Brian Warner, Warner. Yeah, and that's what he wrote it in, and we didn't want to rewrite facade, so we use it just for that. Everything else though, we write, we use SQL Alchemy because we like it way better. So the, and the first thing we did with Facade is we sort of decomposed it and genetically modified it. So heavily. All of, yeah, we took it from one giant file to seven different files that do specific things and are imported as appropriate. So mm -hmm. it's a bit easier for us to manage as the people who didn't build it that yeah. way. But it is, you know, it did have a pretty, pretty strong solid foundation you did in direct SQL. So 
we did not rewrite that using SQL Alchemy. At least that hasn't happened yet. Yeah, not yet. If you want to do that, Andy. And the workers are pretty standalone. They're built so that, like, you know, whoever wants to go and create a worker, they can. Basically, like, they can use whatever package they want to insert things into the database, but as long as it can insert into the database and can receive, uh, can communicate through HTTP with the broker, then, um, then it's good to go. What would be the most useful thing? Okay, so I, I don't know Python very well, um, but I'd like to contribute. What would be the most useful thing I can do for you guys? Um, documentation. Help me with documentation because it's not been updated in a very long time, and I'm going to be making updates to it and switching it, and I will need people that do not know how Augur works to help me test it because. I know how it works. I know this. I know all the bugs and how to fix them when stuff goes wrong. So yeah. the install don't the install docs don't work so well on me because I already know it. So I will need people who are who are not familiar. At least I, I jumped in before you said anything, Sean. That's what I would need help with. Good. So I'm looking at your requirements.txt. Um, which of these is the graphing package that you're using to generate the graphs? That would be in the um, the package. That's the Viga. Yeah, that's in the front end directory, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the requirements.txt file is just for our back end dependencies, and our front end dependencies are listed in the front end directory in the package.json file. Okay, cool. And so our graphing library specifically is Viga Lite, um, but it has dependencies attached to it, like uh, just Viga. Uh, which we plan to make graphs with too as well, and um, Vega Embed is closely related. Uh, and then, yeah, yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Would, would you guys be interested in packaging the backend up into a Docker container, the, the bit that runs behind port 5000? We've, we've done that, we had that in um, up in We've had that before, and I think we're interested in doing that again. Many moons ago. Um, and it's not, I don't think it's actually going to be that hard to create a Docker container out of it. Um, and if, uh, I mean, what's the, I mean, would that be easier for many people to deploy than installing an application? We'll see in head Personally, I think it'd be nice. It'd be nice. I mean, the, the install went pretty well, but. I mean, can you do both? Sure. I mean, I think I think the <laughs> Docker is is something we've we've actually got a Docker config uh, that we will be able to modify that some of our old versions of Augur are deployed with. So very old. Yeah, very old. Over but a year old. Yes. Not over a year. Wait, well, no, we no, no. We were first in May. Yeah, yeah. What am yeah. I thinking? Yeah, they're updated from May. Um, well, might be. At this point, it might be easy. Well, as good as you. But the yeah, but yeah, creating a Docker container um, we've done before, and we'll I think probably the next time we push to master here in the next week or so, we'll 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 build up a Docker container mm -hmm. so that you can do that as well. Um, my last question is, um, if, if I run across people who express interest in the Docker. Uh, what is the right way to engage with you guys? Is it is it premature to engage with you? Are you, are you interested in doing demos? Um, I mean, I, what, I, what are your thoughts on that? So I think one of the things that we are is we're we're trying to be really good at prototyping uh, Augur or Chaos Metrics as quickly as possible, and using technologies that a lot of people are familiar with and interested in working in. And so when it comes to doing demos, I think we've certainly, the way that we've done this before, and we have done demos and we do do demos, do do, mm -hmm. um, uh, I said that. Uh, give us, someone will give us a list of repositories that they're interested in and we'll load them up and uh, process them. The bigger the repository list, the longer it takes. So um, we're, we're pretty efficient at you know, 100 or less that doesn't take that long. I think when you get over 100, 
then it's just a question, honestly, of your GitHub API limit and your CPU for going through the Git repositories. But after you've been through them one time, keeping them updated is relatively low cost mm -hmm. and low overhead. Mm -hmm. It's getting that first chunk of data for the repository set that you're interested in. Um, and the way that we've done it for people in the past, and obviously with this installation process we discussed earlier, we're super interested in having people build their own auger, but we've done it as a hosted thing for people because that's been faster and easier for us as we've been developing our installation process. But I think at this point we can do a demo that includes the install mm -hmm. and very shortly uh, loading up of your repositories. I mean, it, if there's uh, if there's a need for it, we could even have a, a we could show the installation and then also just have pre-set up some repositories like the ones they care about that would we could give it time to collect so we could go okay here's what it's like to install and then after you're done here's what it would look like. There would be some more work so we'd have to know a little bit farther ahead of time, but that's something that we that we could do if because mm -hmm. I mean I think people would think that's helpful to see both, but. Okay, how did we do on the um, agenda so far? So we've installed Augur. Uh, we've done a little bit of an overview of the API, a um, little bit of overview of the architecture. Uh, are there any other questions? We've got about four minutes left here. My question is why is that taking so long? But something I did, I probably. Well, this is really helpful. Did just the screen get resized? Because I saw graphs over off in the corner. No, those are meant to be there. They're separate. Yeah, it's just, just so All right. Well, so long as it's been helpful, that's good to hear. So you can see, like, some projects have giant numbers of issues. Other projects have less giant numbers of issues. Um, we keep track of all of that. Um, one thing I wanted to show, Andy, you mentioned, for example, creating an issue worker. Um, the schema for Augur. Is, is relational, there's some enforcement of rules. So to collect an issue, to like build a worker for a different issue system, your first thing is gonna be create the issue. Um, most issue trackers have events or some kind of events API around them, labels uh, and messages. So one thing about Augur that, that we designed into it is that messages from issue trackers, mailing lists, pull requests, commits, all messages are stored in a common message table so that if you wanted to do some kind of computational linguistic analysis or other analysis of the kinds of conversations people have that you will have that data available to you. And I think, I think a lot of people are interested in that and usually you have to go collect all those conversations from different places uh, and in Augur we just keep them all in one table and you can see there's a, a message ID and then there's for each kind of message, there's a bridge entity. Uh, here's the issue message rep. So for each message ID that's related to an issue, it's gonna have a, a row in this issue message reference table. And currently the GitHub issue worker handles all of that for GitHub issues, and the GitHub pull request worker handles the, all of that for pull requests on GitHub. But there is, there is no limit except your imagination to what you can store in the message table. John, what is that visualization tool that you're using? I use Navicat Data Modeler. Um, it's it's like $400, but it's the best $400 I ever spent because, um, you know, our, our scheme is not perfect. Our, namings, our, our naming standards aren't perfect, but they're much more consistent than anything else that I've been working with in the open source space. So I think if you just populated the database, and wanted to do your own queries and you're familiar with SQL that you would have a pretty easy time with this diagram plus the naming conventions being reasonably consistent that, that you can make your way through it. That it doesn't rely heavily on that. You can use the API to build an app, but there's certainly a ton of data that the workers gather that is not exposed in an API right now and that you may want to summarize in your own way. 
so as I've been talking with people about Augur, which which isn't much by the way. Yeah. But but as I have been, um, what I the opinion that I express is that the greatest value that Augur provides is a standard uh, schema for gathering metrics on open source data. Um, which, which you might not agree with. No, I mean, I think we, we did it because we were really tired of having to try to figure out how to get all the data that we wanted from all these different places and process it differently. Like we, we specifically created the common data model and the broker worker architecture because we were tired of having that problem ourselves. Do you have any, do you have any vision or have you guys talked at all about kind of a management process for revising the, the schema itself? Uh, the way it's worked so far is uh, I've been an overlord of the schema, so um, that that makes sure that the workers consistently work and and that um, there's some centralized command there. Um, I think if you had things that you wanted to add to the schema that you could simply there's a there is a we keep the schema reasonably up to date and it's located in the KSR and we're out of time so I will let people go if they need to. I'll take a few more questions because I think I have something coming up at 2.15 but underneath um, Augur, so Augur Augur, there is a persistence schema folder and I'm in master right now so let me go to dev. It's one of the things I don't particularly care for in GitHub is it changes me. Um, yeah. Uh, so basically, here's the schema file, um, and it's like four thousand lines almost. Yeah. But you can, you know, you can take a tool like Navicat and change it. You can, you know, create your own things and change it. You know what I like about using a a modeling tool is it was. I don't think it would have been possible to build as much as we did over the summer if we weren't keeping track of the data, if like there wasn't centralized control of it. I think now we're at a point where we can entertain pull requests that that um, provide different data. Um, well, for me, this looks awesome. Thank you guys very much for your no, time. Thank you to dig in more. Yeah, and uh, we look forward to talking further with everyone and um, we'll, we'll see you online. <laughs>